what I'm here to talk to you today about is the book that we released in November called 17 Steps of Stone Escaping Paradise. And I have books here and we are donating 100% of what people spend, $10 a piece, uh, to, at our club we did Backpack Buddies. I don't know if you do Backpack Buddies. So if that's all right, it'll go to Backpack Buddies. And when you get one afterwards, uh, I'll be happy to pers personalize it. They're already signed. And uh, we raised uh, $220 when we gave the talk at, um, at uh, the Rotary Club of Front Royal. Um, anyway, this is a story, it's a true story, and it's a, it's a story of a suburban couple who casts it all aside, moves to the Caribbean, buys a hotel, runs a hotel, and thank God sold a hotel. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think you'll, you know, you'll find there's some humor in here, most of the jokes or the laughs are at my expense, but anyway, uh, this is an example of one of the book talks we gave. We spend the month of February on Key West, and the library there uh, hosted us one time. They do a series of author talks, and uh, uh, you can't read all that, but this is the, the flyer they put out on that one. So this is a real-life experience. Um, as, I, as I said, uh, we, uh, you're going to learn about the, the good, the bad, and the very lucky. Uh, as you read through this. So have you ever wanted to leave the busy life behind and move to the Caribbean? This is a couple of, a story of a couple you know that did exactly that. And it's totally nonfiction. It's an account of our entire experience. As I mentioned, the good, the bad, and the lucky. And it's not a how-to book or a how-not-to book. It's just our ride on the roller coaster. Now, interestingly, in the reviews that we've gotten, uh, I've had two people come back to me and say, Cal, this isn't a, this isn't a uh, Caribbean adventure story. This is an entrepreneurial story. And he said, you ought to be marketing this as a business book. And Sam Sneed, who read it from our club, said, this is a must read for any real estate agent. So, and I know there's a couple here. And Melanie's holding out for when it's a, a free book, but <laughs> she's had like six chances to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, roots, the roots of this uh, story, uh, this, this took place in 2006 and 2007, and I, I had lost my humor pretty, pretty severely for a little while during this period, but toward the end of the year I had regained my humor, we had uh, a contract to sell the, sell the hotel, and so we put out a Christmas letter, and I know you can't read that, but I'm going to read a few pieces of it. Uh, Christmas letter 2006 from Cal and Joan, temporarily serving six months to life on St. Croix. <laughs> 32 years together, and this is our first Christmas letter. We've always tried to send a personal note along with cards we send, giving a small update on where we were and what's new and how the kids are doing. Great. Um, this year provided events that, that require more than a few words. In fact, 2006, for us, is the subject of an upcoming book we just have to write. At the time, the title for the cover was, I Just Want to Be Dry. <laughs> it, it is the true story of a suburban couple that rather impulsively follows the dream, casting it all aside, buying a small hotel in the Caribbean. <clears throat> What's wrong with that idea? Nothing until you get past chapter four. <laughs> if you've ever read Herman Walk's novel, Don't Stop the Carnival, you may wonder how we can tell this story and not be charged as plagiarists. All we can tell you is this is a work of nonfiction. I'm going to read you a few of the chapter titles. Uh, in, the, in the letter we said, the book's going to be in development in 2000, during early 2007. For the purpose of the Christmas letter, you're going to be satisfied with chapter heading, headings and a few occasional comments. Now, 2007 turned into 2017 by the time. We, Joan was very diligent in her librarian way, and when we came home, she wrote nine chapters, and I dilly-dallied and eventually got there. Um, but we worked real hard on it last year. Uh, at the time, and the reason that the book was going to be called I Just Want to Be Dry is you will not believe how much you sweat down there. 
and and it would be I would you know I'd be working in the uh, doing the cleaning and so on. I would sweat through three or four t-shirts before noon. You get done, you take a shower, you dry off, and just as you sat down with the room, it rained, and you had to run out and grab the, uh, the the cushions off the chairs and so on. Anyway, chapter one: seeds of discontent. We're fed up with the life in the big city. Joan threatens to go buy a B&B &B in the Caribbean and hasn't decided if she'll tell Cal where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter two, the internet is a dangerous place where Cal decides a preemptive strike is in order. He'll find it first. <laughs> Chapter three, it's just a vacation. We'll just take a look while we're there, but trouble brews for a couple that has moved quickly five times in this career. Chapter four, hey, it's easy. We get all the business we want. Where low occupancy numbers are easily explained away by pleasant little hostesses. Chapter five, the thrill of the deal. Where Cal loses sight of whether he's making a good deal or just proving he can do it. <laughs> Chapter six, ugly truths about insurance on a Caribbean island. Why people there self-insure. <laughs> Chapter seven, we're all in, baby. The house sells and the move date is established. Chapter eight, you must be nuts, but friends and neighbors really mean when they tell you this has always been their dream. I won't read all of these here, but uh, chapter, chapter 12, just how am I gonna spend my thousand dollars today at the hardware store? <laughs> what you wake up wondering after three weeks in a historic property. You just need to make it to chapter 14. You just need to make it through one high season. Advice from sur sur uh, surviving entrepreneurs. When is that, asked Cal? Oh, sometimes as early as the end of January through like April 1st. Anyway. Uh, chapter 17. Fun stories about colorful characters. They're all here because they're not all there. <laughs> uh, chapter 18, the exit strategy. This could be a five year pro uh, process. And then lastly, chapter 20, heading home with lessons learned by having the, had the guts to try, not to mention a book to, to write. So uh, what we've done in the past is two brief readings. I wish Joan was here to read her chapter, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and read it if you don't mind. Forward, which is by both of us. And by the way, when we did this, we have somewhat alternating chapters and a lot of people have commented in the uh, reviews that they love the, the back and forth between what a woman's thinking and what a man's thinking, that's it. <clears throat> Forward. In 2006 and early 2007, we took a walk on the wild side. We did what dozens of people have told us they would love to do, but lack the nerve to try. We left a comfortable life in the close-in suburbs of Washington, D.C. We said goodbye to our home of 14 years, respectable jobs, membership at the country club, <clears throat> and our beloved dog, Abby not to mention easy access to our two adult daughters who were pursuing their own dreams on both coasts of the U.S. <clears throat> we bought a hotel on the Caribbean island of St. Croix, one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Its name was the Pink Fancy Hotel and its beauty could take your breath away. <clears throat> this book tells the very true story of that entire experience. When we returned to a more conventional life, we were determined to write a book to share our adventure. Joan, as diligent as the librarian she is, set about the process in 2007, quote, before she could forget everything. Cal put completing the book on his bucket list, but as is his custom, he busied himself with resuming his hyperactive lifestyle. He knew he would, quote, never forget anything, and he hasn't. Several chapters, are therefore based on Joan's memories and identified as such. Over the past 10 years, Cal has had time to record and tell his stories many times, entertaining his pals on the golf course and elsewhere. His chapters are interposed with Joan's and pick up the story from about the time reality set in. We hope you enjoy the journey. Looking back, 
we've had nothing but fond memories of the entire experience, despite some close calls with disaster along the way. We love the people we met on the island. Crucians have found a lifestyle that suits them just fine. What's not to love when you wake up every day far from the intensity and discord of modern day America? On St. Croix, the, the bright sun shines every day. The daily shower inevitably produces a rainbow and there's, quote, always a breeze. I'm gonna read Joan's prologue, which is a little longer than that, and I may skip a little bit of it, but you'll get the gist. Prologue, the rat. <laughs> Seven, and this, this is in Joan's words. Seven in the morning, and time to get moving. I stretch in my bed. Cal, my husband of over 30 years, is always up long before me. The huge tropical room decorated with brightly colored wallpaper and white wicker furniture is deliciously cool from the window air conditioner, which runs all night, along with the ceiling fan, which is never turned off. Here I am, as they say, beginning another day in paradise. Then I realize anew that I'm not on a tropical vacation. I live here. Everyone's dream, right? Chuck it all in and move to the islands, move to, to an island in the tropics. Only there's more. Not only am I not on vacation and live here, but we also work here, as in constantly, 24-7. The luxurious room I woke in is part of a small, quaint, 14-room inn that we own. And although it's August, low season, which is apparently most of the year, we do have a few guests. This is a bed and breakfast. I know Cal, I know that Cal will take care of setting up the meal, but I want to do my fair share. I throw on a pair of gym shorts and a t-shirt. I know there's no point in showering at this time of day. First of all, our bathroom doesn't seem to want to deliver hot water until midday after the solar panels have baked in the sun. Second, I know that the only cool place in our two-room dwelling, I know I'm in the only cool uh, place in our two-room dwelling, so I will be sweating profusely the remainder of the day. I reluctantly turn off the air conditioner for the day. It's far too expensive to run more than absolutely necessary. I open the bedroom door to our adjoining den, home office, and linen storage combined, all contained in about 200 square feet. The blast of hot air takes my breath away. It is stiflingly hot on a Caribbean island in the summer. This, of course, is one of the many facts that hadn't even occurred to me as we charged headlong into this venture. That along with the fact that Cal could sweat on the tundra. <laughs> I pass next into the open air kitchen where we set up the uh, buff buffet breakfast for the guests. To call this kitchen small would be an understatement. Even to quote my mother and call it a quote one butt kitchen is generous. <laughs> it has maybe three by five feet of floor space it has the necessary stove, refrigerator, and sink, but it has no disposal. And there are lovely Im important tiles on the counter, one of which opens onto the pool and serves as the buffet. But there are only five cupboards and only one drawer in which to store everything needed to serve our guests, ourselves, plus everything needed to prepare the food. Since it's open to the pool area, it always needs to be neat and clean. So everything needs to be stored somewhere. The overflow finds its way into the all-purpose den. It had taken me days after the shipment of our household goods arrived to decide what the most important items to keep in the one and only drawer were. It ended up being the silverware, which, kept, which is what Cal had suggested from the start. <laughs> my first duty and the highlight of my day <clears throat> is to say good morning to Peanut and Sally. I sit on the floor with them, stroking them as their tails thump in happy greetings. They are both Crucian mutts. Sally is large and definitely part golden retriever, judging from the way she insists on constant attention. Peanut is small with long hair and is equally fond of attention. The girls, as we call them, came with the hotel, and I couldn't be happier about that. Cal is up on a stool cleaning the ceiling fan over the tiny kitchen that serves both our personal needs and the food and drink headquarters 
for what little we serve our guests in the way of <laughs> breakfast and cocktails. It's probably the first time it's been turned off, let alone cleaned, in months, if not years. Ken, one of our few guests, is already sitting at the table by the pool with his laptop. Apparently, the wireless connection is actually working for a change. Climbing down from the stool, Cal suggests that, he walks, that he'll walk to a local bakery and pick up some pastries for the guests instead of setting up the normal breakfast. After he folds up the stepladder and leaves, trotting down the 17 steps of stone that connect the main level to all things and all things pink fancy to Prince Street below, I start to empty the dishwasher. No easy task, as once the door is open, there's no room to walk around it to put dishes away. As I reach down for some plates on the floor on the other side of the dishwasher and near, and near the floor drain, exactly where Cal stood five minutes ago, where, where Cal five minutes ago had the stepladder positioned to clean the ceiling fan, I spot the biggest, not to mention ugliest, rat in the entire world. <laughs> Cal had told me he'd had to dispose of, of several dead rats over the past month or so, most likely victims of our apparently enthusiastic and efficient ratter, Peanut. <laughs> Fortunately, Cal reported that dead rat finds had always Cal's reported dead rat finds had always occurred before the guests or I made an appearance. Someone who'd lived on the island for many years told us the rats own this island. So we weren't totally surprised when this was happening. However, there I was, alone in the kitchen, looking down at a thankfully dead, well over foot long rat, if you included the tail. I couldn't remember if I closed the dishwasher door or not but I exited the kitchen to the pool area in record time. I can't remember where my beloved dogs, Sally and Peanut Man, and our suspected rat killer, Peanut, were at the particular moment, but they sure weren't protecting me. <laughs> I thought I could just hang out at the breakfast table until Cal returned, but unfortunately, at that moment, Ken decided to refill his coffee cup. If he approached the pot on the buffet counter, there was no way he was going to miss seeing the huge dead rat lying on the kitchen floor, the very kitchen in which his breakfast was prepared each morning. <laughs> I took a deep breath, went back into the kitchen, <clears throat> stood at the counter, making conversation with Ken while doing my best to block his view to the rat inches from my feet. I was fairly certain it was dead. I don't think rats play possum, but it, but it didn't make me feel any more comfortable. He finally went back to the table and the computer, and I hightailed it back out of the kitchen. As soon as I saw Cal at the gate, I raced down the 17 stone steps to announce the grim news as quietly as possible. I'm not sure he believed me, as, as he had been in the exact spot just a short while ago, cleaning the ceiling fan. His normally red face turned white when he saw the size of the monster on the floor. I made sure Ken was distracted while Cal found a large garbage bag, somehow maneuvered the, group, the group, gruesome corpse into it, and I presume took down to the trash. Upon his return, I was standing back in the kitchen, setting up breakfast. With tears in my eyes, I turned to him and said, I want to go home. <laughs> <clears throat> Whose idea was this anyway? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the beginning of the, of the story. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I know you will. Uh, I'm going to read one other thing, or this one you can almost read. A friend of ours presented us this poem just before we left. He named it Fancy That. Joan and Cal have flown the coop, leaving behind the beltway loop. A disappearing act a la Siegfried and Roy, leaving Foggy Bottom for sunny St. Croix. For a little, a little known fact for what it's worth, St. Croix is shorter than the Beltway's girth. From puts and calls and library books to guided tours around bio book, bio book notes. The emphasis now is on customer howls for breakfast, coffee, fresh linen, and towels. Is this a new life start that we conservatives think chancy, or is it just something that strikes their pink fancy? <laughs> so that's, I use that as a divider between the sections of the book. 
<laughs> Here's a few photos. Uh, that's the infamous 17 steps of stone over there. Uh, the property was originally built in 1780. Um, it was uh, about from here to the first hole from where Alexander Hamilton grew up. Um, and there's a, it was on the National Historic uh, uh, Register. And down here on the side, I wish I had a picture of it, there's a plaque naming it on the National Historic Register. And that's Peanut and Sally, the ratter. Um, you can see it was a Caribbean theme for sure. Uh, from that deck, on the, as you can see at the top, you could look out across Christiansted Bay, you could see Tortola, St. John, St. Thomas. It was a beautiful place. And uh, this is the little kitchen area right here. Uh, just a, a little scene of a sunset. And that picture right there is the day we were coming home. <laughs> Hence the slides. Yeah. I, I thought you might be interested a little bit in the writing process. Um, the, uh, it, you know, it became a bucket list thing for me to, uh, to get done. Um, we knew we had a story to tell, and after you read this, you're going to know we had a story to tell. Um, we used a uh, self-publishing service called Create Space. That's an Amazon company. Um, they do three rounds of editing. They do not write a single word for you. Okay, everything is your your words, but they help you out a little bit with, you know, punctuation. They have three different um, editors read your book, and they you know they make the normal corrections and suggestions of hyphenations, and then the next one says I don't think you should hyphenate that, so it goes back and forth. Um, I was very pleased with their customer service. I think. You um, you know when you buy a book and, and read it you'll see that it was it's very cleanly uh, laid out. Um, I gave them of course the, the the picture for the front of the front of the book. This picture actually uh, uh, appeared in Caribbean Life magazine uh, with an article on Saint Croix. Um, <laughs> you know making it a commercial success is secondary. Wanted to write the book. You know it's. it's it's, it was kind of fun to, to push print or actually, uh, you know, push edit or uh, publish. And you really, you know, gave you a sense of uh, really accomplishing something. Uh, making it a commercial success is secondary, but it's our focus now. And uh, it's available on Amazon, on Kindle. And um, we've sold, uh, I've ordered and sold personally about 400 books. Uh, which for a self-published author with you know, no track record is actually pretty good. Um, but you can use all the help you get if you read it. I would really appreciate it if you put a review up on Amazon or Goodreads. It's, it's the re number of review, reviews you get that are important. Put up a, an honest review of whatever you think. But I will tell you, we've had, I think, 35 reviews uh, posted to Amazon and uh, 34 have been five star which is a little surprising. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, the books are $10. 100% of that is going to Backpack Buddies. So if you just want to make a donation to Backpack Buddies, you get a free book. Any questions? Just to go, did you write it on an electronic device or did you copy it? Well, I, I did better long handing it. And then, of course, you got to get it onto the thing. We never printed the book out in the entire process. I've got a friend in the neighborhood who wrote a book, and, and she went through cartridge after cartridge after cartridge. We never once printed the book out, which I thought was, you know, kind of cool. I will say the editors, you know, they give you all the grammatical uh, things and a few suggestions, but they also give you about a one-page you know, summary of what they thought. And, you know, when I sent it off for the first edit, I was like, oh, God, I'm going to get hammered here. And every one of them came back with, you've got a hell of a story here. And, you know, this is really pretty darn good. I hope you're successful with this. So, um, and I called my, they have a, like a project manager. I called them and said, you know, these guys are being highly complimentary. Are they just blowing smoke at me? He says, no, let me tell you, most people call and they're all mad when they get there. <laughs> But so anyway, we're, we're feeling really, we're feeling good about the book. Um, 
I really appreciate you spreading the word. Um, there's a business card in each one of these. We pass it on. And uh, anyway, I hope we raise some money for backpacks. Should we